Welcome to our special program this afternoon with our featured speaker, Jeff Butler. I'm Kathy Pernan, Executive Director for the ISM New Jersey Chapter. Please be sure to use the Q&A tab or chat if you have a question. Jeff is a speaker, author, and workplace strategist who helps organizations create workplaces where employees thrive. Jeff is the author of two provocative books, The Authentic Workplace and The Key to the New You. Jeff is also the CEO of J, J. Butler International. Having written over 100 articles on workplace dynamics, his insights have been featured in dozens of media outlets such as Forbes and HR News. In addition, he has appeared on TED Talks in both 2016 and 17 with both talks focusing on psychology. Before Jeff founded his workplace consulting company, he spent almost a decade in Silicon Valley working as a software engineer, which is where his initial interest in organization psychology began to develop. Since then, he has personally addressed over 100 organizations internationally on workplace dynamics, issues such as Google, um, Google uh, Amazon, LinkedIn, and Wells Fargo. I would now like to welcome our speaker for today, Jeff Butler. Well, thank you, Kathy, uh, for that wonderful intro on there. I see you decided to take the one just from the website on there, which is great. No cat uh, specs or anything like that. So it's great to be here. Uh, I know this is nearing the end of our weeks. Uh, for me, I'm in Massachusetts, so it's about 4 p.m. for myself. And I know a lot of you are all over the uh, the U.S. on here, and it's great that we're all kind of tuning in on here. And, and the topic that I like to address is 21st century leadership, essentially redefining leadership in the new decade. Now, leadership is talked about quite frequently, and in my personal opinion, I think it's highly misunderstood on there. For instance, a lot of people who talk about leadership tend to think of Tony Robbins jumping on stage, pumping your hands, walking on hot coals or being basically a loud verbose leader on there. And I think that's actually a very erroneous conclusion to make about what a leader actually is on here. And in fact, it's not necessarily that you have to be this extremely extroverted, high energy person all the time. Leaders come in many different forms. And so this presentation is gonna be actually looking at the aspect of when you have an individual who's on a team, how do you take them from say, someone who's below performing or maybe brand new all the way to the point where their leadership ability is fully actualized. I'll be showing you guys the steps in order to make that an actual reality on there. Now, during this presentation, uh, I will be using the chat box a little bit on there. So if you are uh, not used to using it, please move up your fingers and get, uh, start using the chat box a little bit because there are a few quizzes in this presentation just to make sure everyone's on course and making sure that people are able to retain the information, okay? Now, the slides are available at jeffjbutler.com slash slides. I know Kathy actually took together a PDF form of the presentation, so you can ask her or go to this link and you'll be able to get the presentation notes on here because the main thing I wanna just uh, have for everyone here is to be able to listen, follow along, okay? And if you have things you wanna go back to, there's always these resources here. In addition, I know Kathy's recording this as well, so you can always go back and watch the recording on there. So very often there's this question of leadership on here. In fact, this is uh, me in Madrid, Spain in 2019. We weren't scared to travel internationally without masks on here. In fact, I don't know if many of you get kind of like a creepy feeling when you look over a crowd and no one has masks on. Well, the interesting thing is, is that um, I, I talk about leadership, right? And I study it and I try to make sense of it. But there is actually an instance where leadership, a leadership instance occurred that I think a lot of you who have been to an in-person event can really relate to. So after this presentation, I sat back in the crowd and I wanted to watch the next one because the next one was this topic that I was really interested in. It was about systems and operations and I was heard of the speaker and they were great. So I was really excited to listen to it. So after sitting down and uh, paying attention to the next presenter, presenter goes up and all of a sudden, about two minutes into the presentation, you hear this eerie noise of multiple people talking at the same time, yet there's one speaker. 
And all of a sudden, everyone runs, uh, walk, looks around like, who the heck is else talking or getting a hold of the mic? And you start hearing this crackling noise. And the whole presentation just goes off the rails. In fact, the presenter had to turn off his microphone. And he literally stood up on stage and waited. Now, as a presenter, I have some familiar with AV equipment. So I got up to help out. But then I realized something. This could be a perfect opportunity to see who actually gets up and helps the person in charge. Well, in the room, the speaker just stood and everyone just watched and wondered when was this problem going to be resolved? Because whenever the speaker turned it back on, the crackling noise would happen. So they just, he just stood up there and continued just looking at the crowd and they looked back. Well, about 10 minutes later, the AV team came in and actually fixed it and the presentation continued. But that surprised me that a room of 80 people, no one would go up and say, how can I help? What can I do? How can I resolve this problem on there? And I really think that that fundamental ability to go up, if you have some sort of, um, let's say in this sense, a, a leadership ability, it's to have that ability to have that vision and then act on it. You see something wrong and you can move on. That's a personal leadership motive. But very often what people normally focus on is this more external type of leadership. And that is to get people to do what needs to be done on there. That's usually what's more talked about. But in this presentation, I'll be more focusing on the personal leadership. And as an outsider, how do we invoke that ability? of having someone have that vision and then act on that vision. And that's sort of how I break down leadership in this sense. Now, in the world of leadership, there's a lot of different uh, types in that sense. And the thing though about leadership is that very often poor leadership skills can lead to a lot of negative outcomes, as you might be quite aware of, and hopefully you do, that you know that uh, people don't necessarily leave jobs, they leave managers. As a business owner and someone who has consistently been around people who have been great leaders, but also poor, you know, if someone's leaving a job, that there's a very strong indication that the person who is their boss, that might be a big contributor to the reason why they don't like their job on there. So it does play a large role in terms of how the people around them feel on there, but it also goes beyond that further on there. For instance, the the myths about leadership come in several fold. For instance, you have a lot of different items of leadership that can go across the board on this. The first one is that believing that all leaders are charismatic. Absolutely not true. And if you think you have to be charismatic, that is not true at all. In fact, look at Silicon Valley. Look at the biggest people who are in those, uh, run those companies. <laughs> Vast majority of them are extremely introverted, quiet, kind of awkward individuals, yet they somehow can lead. And for anyone here who might be more of the Shire type, just let everyone know here that that's possible. In fact, what might surprise a lot of people is that even though I speak for a living, I'm highly introverted. Uh, I was a software engineer. I spent most of my time working with computers rather than working with people because I'm extremely shy. When a presentation happens, I have permission to speak. But if I'm in a classroom, I'm in the back of the room, putting my head against the wall, paying attention, but very closed off on there. Another big myth is that people who are leaders have to come from outside of an organization. Very often leaders come from the internal parts of the organization on there because the interesting thing is, is that leaders, like the people who are inside the organization, absorb the culture and they become the perfect people to bring up and lead further on because they hold those values of the team on there. And last but not least, the myth of the burning platform or very often that you have to put people under an enormous amount of pressure in order for things to happen. The COVID-19 effect, as I like to call it on there. Uh, for leaders to come out, you don't necessarily need the circumstance on there. In fact, a lot of organizations, for instance, places that you have heard of like 3M, have been notoriously known to constantly be innovating and putting pressure in terms of the environment of trying things a little bit different and continuously growing on there, on that front. So those are some myths about leadership that I thought would be helpful on there because very often we tend to, let's say, make it a grandiose vision of uh, leadership. In fact, a lot of introverts, each one of these individuals, who I'm sure you recognize the faces of many of them, Eleanor Roosevelt, 
Um, you have also Miss Harry Potter originator on the right hand side as well. But a lot of these individuals are extremely introverted on there, yet are notoriously known to be hum like very, very strong leaders on there. And so to, please do not conflate the charismatic side with the leadership principle on there. Now, when you think about leadership, here's a really easy way of looking at it on here. When you're thinking about uh, an organization, for most people in an organization, they're passengers. They're either brand new, but they're just sitting along for the ride of going on a road trip. Now, the next tier is the drivers. And these are the people who are setting the car on its way. But here's the thing, the top one is navigator. Now, here's the thing, out of these three uh, individual positions on here, you have your passengers, you have your drivers, you have your navigators. What is the most important one to getting the place where you wanna to go to? Go ahead in the chat room, we'll warm up our fingers here for the first question. Out of these three items, which one is the most important to ensure you arrive at the correct destination on here? Awesome. Most of you have said right off the bat, navigator. And the thing is, is anyone who's had an individual who's in a car, who's never actually worked Google Maps before, and it's their first time, know how important a navigator is because the driver takes their eyes off the road, a car accident can happen, babies are crying, every, it's a whole big mess. So it's great that you have the, the navigator is the most important role. So the first tier is passenger, second is driver, and third is navigator. That's the steps that we're actually going to be taking in this presentation. Now, a lot of times what we run into are certain hurdles. For instance, the big one that I, I focus on is the generational side of things. And how do people work when you say have a senior leader in a workplace, but also a brand new employee, how do you actually bridge those gaps on there? In fact, I used to give a lot of talks on technology and eventually someone in the back of the room said, hey, you look like you're 14. Why don't you give talks about generations? Uh, of course, they knew I wasn't 14, but they're more just making the remark, hey, you have a younger perspective. Why don't you talk about this? And so as I looked into the more of the research, I realized a lot of it was erroneous because the way that generations work might not necessarily be correct on the media. And where I really realized this is, um, this is my family picture on my dad's side. Uh, there's me on the far right. Hopefully you can recognize my face okay. It wasn't Photoshopped. Um, my mom's on the right, my dad's in the blue suit, and the right to the left of my dad right here is my grandfather. And that's the chain of the uh, generations on there. Now, weirdly enough, my grandfather asked me this crazy question. And he was like, hey, um, do you want to live with me? And this is back in 2018 before COVID. And I thought that's a really bizarre thing because in my entire life, I probably spoke to my grandfather maybe 10 hours out of 10 years. Don't really know him. So I don't know if I move out there, the shining is going to happen. He's going to chase me around the house with a knife. I don't know. So I start questioning. I say, hey, um, do I have to uh, like take out the garbage, recycling? He said, yeah, you might have to help out with one or two things. Fair enough. Um, dug a little further. Hey, do you have a caretaker? Because he recently had uh, his third heart surgery. Uh, he only has about 40% of his heart left on there. He has skin cancer. He has a whole list of different challenges that he faces being 82 on there. And he says, no, I have that handled. So then I went for the jugular. I'm like, hey, do I have to pay rent? He's like, nope. So what I did is I actually, this is the United States picture at night with all the, the lights. On the far left, I used to live in California. Then I flew all the way over to Massachusetts to uh, help out my grandfather. Because uh, he recently bought a new place that was actually the dream house that he promised my grandmother he would buy when they first got married. So he bought it, he needed someone to watch, uh, help him out with it. And so he has a background in construction, I have a background in tech. And as I had to help him out because he's of course 82 and I'm, I was in my uh, late twenties. And I was uh, learning how to you know, work with different parts of technology and the different tools. In fact, uh, there's like things called stud finders, right? And stud finders find wood and walls. And so I used to think that whenever he told me to go uh, get the stud finder, it was an app to find stubby men. Like I had no idea what a stud finder was. So after I learned a little bit more, I was fixing my first furnace. And so he played backseat quarterback and he was telling me what to do with the furnace. Well, 
fair, sure enough, I ended up replacing the part. I stood back and I thought in my head, awesome progress, one more thing fixed. And he stood up not knowing what I thought and said out loud, awesome progress. 82, mid, late 20s, for some reason, we were thinking exactly the same thing. And at that point, I knew that regardless of that generational gap, there is some sort of channel where people can work together effectively in an environment where that leadership actually takes place effectively on there. So there is that ability to overcome, say, those larger gaps on there. Of course, different generations bring different demands on there. For instance, what a lot of people are talking about today, especially considering the political turmoil that's taking place, is aspects of such things such as diversity on there. Now, this is always a huge debate and also very uh, polarizing from some respect. So in my modest opinion, I would just say as a business owner, but also looking out in the world, one big thing I like to say on this note is the equal opportunity versus outcome on there. Some of the diversity movement says, hey, equal outcome, people should be of a certain demographic. Well, equal opportunity says, regardless who, if someone's able to meet the bar, they're on board. And so this can go back and forth in terms of what's the right approach on this. My personal opinion is that if someone's good enough for the job, it doesn't matter what background they have, they can be fit for that role on there. In fact, I had this debate with someone who was huge in diversity. They're like, yeah, 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 we should have diversity. And I said, you know, what's really weird about that is it turns out I have in my company 90 or 85% women. It's not on purpose. It was just the candidate pool had mostly women on there and the roles that we had, they were, they, they did the interviews great. They were hired and did a wonderful job. And I'm very happy with that. But if someone look at the company and say, why is that so lopsided? Well, here's the thing. That was the candidate pool that we faced with. So this is a very interesting thing with diversity on there. But one big thing is as someone in terms of hiring practices, I always look up beyond that. What can they do? Or can they accomplish the job? That's the big thing that I look at beyond just whatever's in their background per se. So you have the diversity demands. You also have work-life balance. This used to be huge before COVID. Now people are very comfortable working from home and having that ability on there. And that's really over made people travel years into the future on there, especially with less progressive industries that are very reluctant to have things such as remote work on there. There's also career development side, which is, um, when people join companies, they want to grow in their company uh, and be able to, I guess, drive a lot from it. There's a weird thought, though, that I like for people to have to ponder over. And I always feel that if someone's really relying on the company to making them happy, I always felt that a little bit strange because very often it's in your very often people aren't very happy in general, if you look at the statistics overall. And if they're expecting the company to <laughs> make them happy, it's like, well, it kind of starts with the individual and what they want to derive from it. And very often companies look at different HR policies in order to make the company absolutely wonderful. But very often there could be a company that's just able to provide a consistent paycheck and that's okay because they're, that individual is able to take care of very important parts of their life, take care of kids, family, mortgage, whatever it may be in order to sustain a lifestyle. And even say a menial job can provide a humongous purpose for someone in their life. And of course you have purpose on there. And I think that maybe companies should not be the, have to derive the purpose for the employees, but rather the employees have to ask themselves, what do we have to, what is the purpose of this job in my own life on here? So for the the whole culture-driven leadership, we're going to tackle the first one, which is the aspect of the passenger on there. Now, with a passenger, if we're going to define it, very often that is someone who's probably brand new, they're a poor performing employee on there, they require high supervision, they lack knowledge of how, what, when, those basic fundamentals. So the question then is, how do you take someone who's at this beginner stage and move them up to a level where they're actually a solid contributor in the company itself? And this is actually a lot more simple than people realize on here. For instance, there are this aspect of something called expectations on there. Now, weirdly enough, expectations are the great equalizer when you have, say, a culture on there. In fact, in relationships in general, this is extremely common to have set expectations. For instance, if you ever want to get into an argument with someone, a, a significant other, you just have to make sure that your expectations and the, the other person's expectations are not aligned on something. For instance, who does the dishes? Who does the laundry? 
Uh, who fills up the car with gas? If your expectations are aligned, a guarantee fight is going to end up somewhere. So these expectations carry over in any area of life, but most importantly, in the workplace and the culture, there is a set of expectations that of an employee has when they enter in a working relationship. If the employee employer have different expectations, that's where you tend to get those areas where you have, say, the constant tension and friction points on there. But it's also the area that drives the culture. Think about if you have people who have high expectations for a team, the culture itself will also be ri risen, uh, will rise correspondingly in general on there. With that said, this really became uh, prevalent and uh, prominent to me was when I was when I first met the individual uh, Bill Woodich. Now, Bill Woodich is a very interesting like kind of American story where he grew up in an extremely poor area of Pennsylvania. In fact, his career development when he first uh, graduated college, he would be hammering, hammering wood on there and a promotion was painting the wood. Okay, that's the kind of work that he had. So it was dead end work. And eventually he ended up, his brother let him stay, his older brother actually let him stay with him and uh, said, hey, you might want to try out uh, a job in insurance on there. And surely enough, he went into insurance and it ended up to be a complete natural in it. And I don't know if many of you have seen the commercials with Liberty Mutual on there with like the ostrich and the guy like sitting at the beach. Oh, let's let me read this thing. And the ostrich is always there, which is really random. But I, I guess they're going for the Geico thing. Anyways, Bill Woodish became the number one sales rep there back-to-back -back years, went to another firm back-to-back -back years, which is extremely difficult to do on there. Eventually, he moved out to California and started his own company from there. And this is how, like you would say, risky the guy was. He literally leased out a whole building when no one even worked there, like this big, and just paid a huge lease and slowly filled up each room one by one. But he was so confident that he was going to make it that that was going to happen. Now, the big key to the team working effectively and turning people from, say, passengers to drivers to actually navigators was setting that high expectation of what he wanted people to actually do in the company. And surely, uh, slowly but surely, years went by. In fact, I think they've been in business for over 28 years now. He excelled and ended up becoming, um, I wouldn't say famous, but he's gotten some positive uh, press on there. But his big thing that he, uh, he was telling me about the whole process of turning, say, an individual, like a group of employees or individuals into a awesome organization is the ability to set the expectations on there. What do you expect of the individual on there? What is their role? What is the a level of activity that you expect of them each day? Because that will influence the rest of the culture on there. Now, in a quantitative sense, this can be something as simple as an SOP, standard operating procedure on there. What are the sort of things that people need to do day to day, the purpose, the definition, the how, what, when. For someone that may be, say, in sales on there, it might be, here's how you email someone. Here's how many emails you do a day. If it's someone who's like an engineer, it's if you're going to take your code and bring it into the main code base, here are the steps that you have to perform. That's saying explicit expectations. Once you do that, it becomes a lot more evident whether or not someone's meeting that bar. And if you ever have that conflict with a new employee coming into the workplace, always ask, what are the expectations that we have and what are the expectations that they have in their mind on there? And very often you find that there's some sort of distance between the how, the what, or the when. And if you're able to identify that, that's when you start being able to break down, is this someone who is maybe apathetic about the job or they're capable about the job and we just need to improve some of these systems that are within the company. Another area where you can actually measure expectations more quantitatively is this is actually a dashboard on an eight by eight. Absolutely love the company on there. And it's basically a calling center on there. Now, I know a lot of you probably don't want to be hooked up into a calling center format with all the statistics, but the main thing is in different areas of work, the goal is to make some sort of expectations clear, transparent, 
And in a way that as a leader, you're not, you don't have to constantly look over someone's shoulder. You can just check the dashboard, how they're doing, and you don't have to constantly be looking over the shoulder, reminding them because then that will create, say, a lack of trust, this engagement will kick in. And eventually they're like, hey, my boss is always over my back. I don't trust them. And then you start having that dissonance in there. Now, as someone starts off in the company, of course, they will have very low expectations in the beginning, but over time they'll rise. And of course, the coaching involvement will drop correspondingly as well on there. However, if the coaching still remains high after a while, chances are they're not meeting the job expectations. Now, the goal is to make sure that during this process, you're able to ensure they're on the right track at the right time on there. But here's the tricky thing. In order to make and set someone up for a driver, but also a navigator position, there's a very critical component is that when you are working with someone individually, being able to set the expectation saying, hey, here's the work, this is what we do here, but also ask for their feedback during that process and showing interest in what they know, eventually trust will start to ensue on there because you're consistent, you're also showing the trust and eventually they might say, hey, um, I think we might be able to do X better. When you hear that, that's the key for spying and navigator, but we'll go into that a little bit later. But the, the key thing here, as you see, is consistency, showing interest in what they do, and that right there creates trust on there that someone has in terms of the workforce, because it's a huge thing that people always talk about in the workforce is high engagement. Well, a big factor they say in there is people feeling psychologically safe. You can look at the Google studies that were done with Project Aristotle, and one of the big pillars to a great, comp, uh, great team they had is psychological safety. But a lot of that comes from is I feel safe in this environment to say something and not be ridiculed. It could be completely wrong, but at least you don't necessarily have a repercussion for the team to offer an idea, not do the wrong thing, but offer an idea on there. And if you're able to do that, that's when you start being able to leverage that generational knowledge. And of course, diversity that's in the workplace. Now, occasionally, and this does happen, no matter how good you are at recruitment, you will have someone who's an underperformer. Now with underperformers, it's not an easy situation to handle regardless who you are. Maybe you're a psychopath and you don't mind too much, but I think generally most people really don't like having to deal with this. And very often in order to handle an underperformer is when you have those expectations, you set the deadline, you already have the quantifiable boundaries. Hey, here's when you show up, here's when you leave, here's the certain things you have to do each day, here's the level of performance that I want. And if they're below those expectations at a certain point, sit them down, hey, I noticed this underperformance right here, three uh, months down the line, we're gonna check in on this point, I expect your mark to be up here. If you set up those boundaries very often that I've seen, and also research points out, is that a lot of people will actually fire themselves because they'll say, you know what, I know the boundaries, I'm not meeting them. I don't want to be uh, fired on here. So I'm just going to leave myself on here. And you know what? That makes it a lot easier of a discussion for if someone actually leaves because they know what the, the boundary is. And of course, you're keeping the integrity of following up with it. And it becomes a much easier discussion on there. Now, if they don't, uh, if they fire themselves and they're still underperforming on there, of course, that's when you go into performance review still not able to do that. Well, at least you have things written out. So in an HR perspective, it's a lot easier to handle someone who's not able to meet your level of expectation that you set as a leader on the team. So at that point, then you now have your passengers, right? You have that level of expectation. The culture is now built around it. You have your systems. Now the individual is starting to learn those and now they're becoming an individual contributor and they're now driving the team forward and performance on there. But at this point, period, most companies stay locked in at this point on here. But before we go further, I have a true and false quiz just to make sure that everyone's following along okay. So the first question that we have on here, and this is a true or false, so it's a lot easier than just random <laughs> fill in the blank. All right, so first true and false question. In the chat room, say true or false, if expectations drive engagement, expectations drive engagement, true or false on here. All right, Patty, Trisha, George, Scott, Guz on here, all over the board. 
on here in terms of trues and falses on here. So expectations can drive engagement. This is actually both true and false from a perspective on here. In the presentation, I said culture. However, if you want to look at it from the perspective of if your expectations set, they're automatically more engaged on there. I think it's a fair argument, so it can go either way on there. But just the hammering home point is cult, the expectations can also drive culture. All right, consistency plus interest equals trust on there. So Brian, Joel, Kim, perfect. All right, pretty easy one on that. Sure, a lot of you got that. Pretty easy one to get. All right, I'm going to throw everyone here a curveball just to make sure everyone's following along okay. All right, so we talked about generations here. And very often in the remote world, you're going to have to deal with different emojis and understand what emojis say. So if you see this in a chat room, what is someone trying to convey? If you see this emoji in a chat room, what are they trying to say? Gary says search dog on there. Quite close, Gary, by the way. Looking for a lost dog. <laughs> Imagine, right? Watchdog. Okay, we got a couple on watchdog on here. Everyone's gonna get mad at me after I, I share this. So it's close. Spy dog. No clue by Karina. All right. I'm sorry, but everyone's gonna roll their eyes and they see this. Uh, this is Snoop Dogg. <laughs> so, <laughs> had to do it. Had to throw that one out there. But I'm, sh I'm sure everyone was like, oh, of course, Snoop Dogg on there. But I've literally never seen a millennial do that. But it's good to know if you see that, just think of Snoop Dogg on there. All right, so once someone's reached a driver level on there, they are now a consistent driver of the team. Of course, they're gonna require less supervision than someone who has been there for a very short period of time on that front. They have a strong grasp of the job. And of course, they can kind of go back and forth with you in terms of, what should happen on the job for things to be done more effectively on there. They're not at the navigator level where they're independent, but they can maybe reason with the process on there. But here's the thing. Remember earlier that I said when the key parts of getting someone set up for a navigator is those ideas that they offer. Well, here's the interesting thing. When someone offers a new idea, like, let's say we're in a meeting together and someone's like, well, uh, in terms of the uh, supply chain, I think we should actually be positioning it and say the very beginning, of, let's just say some beginning part on there. And they have this novel idea on there. As the manager, it's you have an option. You can either shut it down or let them run with it, even if it's completely crazy, but it doesn't involve many other people. It could be a very useful tool because if the manager does give more authority, and lets them run with this project on the side of what they're doing currently, what starts to happen is that the engagement itself starts to increase of the individual. Because this there's an item in management called um, intrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. So intrinsic is you are internally driven, while extrinsically is something external to you is, to, is making you want to create change. For instance, Let's say uh, there's a child and they want to uh, eat uh, dessert on there. Extrinsic motivation would be a parent saying, hey, uh, if you eat your um, vegetables, you can have the, the dessert. Great. That's extrinsic. But if the child thinks, well, if I want to be healthy, right, of course, I should eat my vegetables. That's intrinsic, right? So there's a difference. Well, when you take that new idea, you're actually harnessing the intrinsic motivation of the employee, which is one of the most powerful things that you can do to have someone feel engaged in the work that they have. But more importantly, beyond that, is that this is the cornerstone to why people even talk about diversity in general, is that you're able to leverage the knowledge of everyone in the company to solve some sort of problem more effectively on here. And this is that beginning part is now they're offering those ideas. And then the question then is, how are those ideas addressed on that front on there? So as a navigator or as a driver on this front, a lot of companies will try this in different ways. In fact, 3M, uh, many of you probably have heard of it, but Post-it uh, post notes, they were a huge 
um, company that were, were involved in making all these little knickknacks that we use today, especially in the office, and very effectively. But they were one of the first places to ever say, employees now have a set period of time where they can work on outside projects. This is a very commonly uh, practiced thing. Now 3M was one of the first. And sure enough, the post-it was made during that time on accident on there. But the main thing was is the organization as itself made the decision to have that say organizational structure um, time to work. And from that, they were able to derive this novel invention from there. They were able to solve some sort of problem uniquely. And that's more of a grandiose perspective of how many of you probably, if you have a team or work with people, can eventually get individuals to think about a problem differently and solve it in new novel ways on there. So that's just an example of one of the many companies that have been able to use this technique effectively. Now, when you have that driver and you start seeing them, they have these ideas, you know, churning in their minds. You can prepare them for leadership in small but subtle ways on there. Um, a few of the easy techniques that you can do to prepare them for leadership is you can get them a buddy. For instance, let's say they've been in the company for a year, new hires there, the person who you're trying to aim for more leadership, they are the buddy of the new person. They show them all the new things and they get to be the person in charge on there, or at least to help the other person become oriented with their tasks on there. Over time, especially more technical teams, one person will really shine out as the go-to expert, the oracle of the team who has all the knowledge and designate them as the subject matter expert on their SME on there. It's a great way of preparing someone for more of a leadership oriented role on there. There's a couple other ways that you can do this too on that front where you can essentially um, prep new materials for teammates on there and, and eventually sign them as a team lead. Those are all different ways that you can prepare someone who are at that driver level who don't necessarily have that position title change to become and start seeing themselves as that leader into and preparing them for more of that navigator format on there. Now, again, this doesn't necessarily mean a title change. It could just be that people around them, they feel the ability that if they have some sort of idea, they're able to realize it, see it, put it down, and then act on it. That's sort of the personal leadership side that we're trying to invoke in individuals, not necessarily prepare everyone for management. Because one truth that a lot of the world of leadership and management fail to recognize is that not all people want leadership positions. Being in a leadership position is very high risk on there. And this is coming from someone who is a business owner during COVID where in my industry, event planning, over 2000 businesses went bankrupt. And I know a lot of individuals on there who ended up becoming unemployed during that time. And somehow I had to make sure we were still profitable and not let everyone go and make sure everything's held together. That level of responsibility kept me up many nights, stressed out. How are we gonna be able to pay everyone? The whole revenue's completely shot with COVID and everything because what I do is you know, I can consult, but also speak and it became basically illegal to do what I do. So how do I say run a company where it's like, well, one of our biggest revenue streams is now illegal. It's like, oh, great. What do we do now? So, but during that, it's a very, um, it's an analogy for not a lot of people like that level of responsibility on there. It's quite stressful and it's not something that everyone would want to do. And in fact, too, there's a lot of also for very technical positions. And this happens a lot. I know it's in engineering. If one engineer on a team stands out Maybe they know a lot of information. The manager above usually thinks, ah, oh, you know, they might be great for this next level improvement. Well, it's not always true because they might just enjoy the craft of whatever that engineering aspect is. But they don't necessarily want to become more of a people person and work with people and then manage individuals, even though they already have the technical knowledge to do so. They might not necessarily have the people knowledge to handle it, nor the intrinsic motivation to have that step. So if you're looking at someone for going more into that leadership position on there, always be wary of just because they know a lot doesn't necessarily mean they would want to have that, which is why you can sometimes sit people down and say, hey, where do you wanna go in your particular career on there? Where do you, 
see yourself in terms of your goals, your priorities on there. And when you have that discussion on there, if their goals extend past their current position and they say, well, I want to you know, be a director, or I want to run a whole team and large grandiose things, chances are you have yourself someone who really wants to grow into a navigator. But on this same thing, like I'm, I talk about this, but I also practice this in my company. I had this really interesting conversation with someone who was a manager in their previous job. And they, we moved them up to a kind of a senior position in there, a kind of exec position. And we said, hey, you know what? Like as things start opening up more, we can move you up to a manager level. Um, is that something you want? And they couldn't make up their mind if they wanted to become an entry level person or go back down or go up to be a manager, which was bizarre. Cause it's like, why would you get paid more, you know? And well, why the drawback? And the interesting thing that I found out was a lot of it is they, the actual task they had as an individual contributor was more fulfilling than doing the manager role on there, which was very, that was fascinating to me on that. But do they offer a lot of things for the company to succeed? Most definitely on there. The team has their respect. And I would say not a title change, but also just as a leader in general, they are monumental in the team's success on there. So one thing is asking, does it, do their goals go past their current position on there? And do they express curiosity outside of the current role functions? You have someone who's very inquisitive is always asking about how does this department work or this, that work in the company? Well, if they're very curious, it means that they, they're looking beyond just what they have there. And that's a very good indicator. And of course, last but not least, is they start to become a team resource, a pivotal role that sort of linchpin that keeps the team going from a knowledge perspective on there. Once you have those sort of uh, answer those questions on there and ask those to an individual, you will start to see you get a really good idea for whether or not they will be able to go into that navigator role on there. So with culture-driven leadership, right, we first covered the aspect of the passenger on there, and we then went into driver, right, someone to drive the team. And now we started to set up the foundation of how to get someone to that navigator level, that they're able to make the decisions and know not only how to drive, but where they should be going on there. Now, once you're able to start to tiptoe in the direction of getting someone to a navigator level, we will first be having to take a quiz just to make sure we're following along. <laughs> okay. All right. So first question on the quiz is easy question here. All right. All entry level employees want promotions. True or false on here? This is such a bizarre thing because it really depends on the industry itself. But generally, this is, as most people say on here, false on here. Some people prefer the position that they're in because it's more comforting. Maybe if there's a huge economic jump between each level, that might be more enticing. But sometimes when you have that entry level to more of a managerial level on there, not everyone wants to make that jump, interestingly enough, on there. And having the assumption that everyone shouldn't want that is erroneous because as I pointed out earlier, there's some things in the entry level position that you get into the work itself that you don't necessarily have when you're in more of the managerial role on there. All right, so the next question is, goals extending beyond the position, their current position that they have, can mean potential for career growth. Is that true or false on there? Awesome, Tim, David, Crystal, Deborah. Awesome, yep, most definitely on there. And interestingly enough, this is a very good interview question to ask on there. I had an interview earlier today where I was interviewing this person to um, join a very important role in the company on there. And when I was talking with her, she was just polished and mature and just, she did this nice presentation, very well, well delivered um, interview. But when I asked her, hey, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? She's like, well, I want to, um, I'm going to move. The like, first thing wasn't career. <laughs> like I said, career related. And she mentioned 
uh, her relationship. She said, oh, I want to move to Europe. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> that was in career, but okay. And she said, I want to go get my PhD in like environmental science. And I thought, huh, like environmental science isn't necessarily what we have here, but maybe you might want the job to pay the bills or whatnot. But as like a hire, uh, hiring manager, I'm thinking if they were saying, I want to be able to lead a team in this kind of environment, it was very similar to where we had it for that career track. It could really um, solidify that on there. Or if they're just like, hey, I want to just close things on there. It could really give you a good idea for where the, the head is at uh, for the individual. All right. Here is the last emoji question of the, uh, the presentation on here. So if you have these four emojis lined up on here, what is someone trying to say on here? And of course, we've got them. <laughs> All right, cool. Right off the bat, people got it. Okay, yep, that's definitely Blink182 on there, as in the, the band on there. Because you have the Blink, the little wink right here, 182 on there. Okay, cool. That was a lot easier than the first one on there. The Snoop Dogg, everyone thought it was Snoop Watch on there. <laughs> Great. So when someone reaches the Navigator letter, level on there, the big keys that usually are happening is that they're excellent performing, they're a resource for others, they have low supervision, and of course, they have mutual reasoning on job objectives. That is huge because that means is the individual is able to reason with the other leaders and say, hey, this is what I think should be done more effectively. And as a business owner, as a manager or leader on a team, I absolutely love it when people say that because I know this could be a novel idea that can revolutionize a business because the reason why my business has even survived during this time is because of this item right here is that like meeting with the team and saying, what can we do differently? What sort of markets can we go after? And they said, we have worked at companies that they've done this and we should go into this because we will think it would help. During that time, this was at the start of the year, it wasn't COVID related, right? COVID was not happening. But that one item that they told me to go into the different market on there completely saved us during COVID on there. So I owe a lot to them on that. And this is exactly the power that it has when you're able to leverage that diverse knowledge that people have and are able to act on it. And that's the whole thing about getting people to navigate our level levels that you're able to really harness that ability out there. Because in companies, um, when I was uh, a little kid, I don't know if you, you recognize these, but these power lines, I always used to think they were like people who were holding like the cables and they would keep the power going for miles and miles and miles. And it reminded me like there's a whole bunch of people lined up just staying there who were hundreds of feet tall holding those cables. And I often think of this in, as a workplace example of where if one person would drop that power line, could power go from one point of the state to the other? And the answer is no. But the same power that runs through these power lines that has to have every single power line standing is the same way in a company where that one idea that someone has in that meeting has to travel to the right people in order for it to affect the organization as its entirety. In order to get people from the passenger driver and navigator level that navigator level is that beginning seed of getting that idea out there and being able to foster that and protect the whole organization is the way we really derive that power within an organization the ability to see leadership and redefine it in this new decade is one of those monumental aspects to really harness that ability on there in fact what is also, so that's great for an organization on there, which is fantastic. Um, but there's also the individual level as well. And one thing I wanted to include here before we wrap things up is that very often that you have sometimes the age difference when you're working with individuals on there, that you will have maybe a senior leader who reports to someone who's younger. And if that ever happens, and I included this because I got so many questions about this before, is if you ever have that leadership dynamic where there's an age difference, where someone's younger managing someone older, always dress the elephant in the room, make sure you turn the tables and create those expectations. Being authentic in who you are and saying, look, I know that you're more experienced than me and in our relationship working together, I wanna make sure that that's noticed and leveraged on you because you know more than me on this. Here's the expectations that I have on there. 
And if you're able to accomplish that, you get over one of the biggest generational hurdles that sometimes takes place where you have, say, a younger leader working with older on there. And with that said, when you're able to do this effectively, right, and you're able to leverage this information, right, going from helping people go from passenger driver to navigator, what's fascinating to me is that if you're able to help someone do that in their work life, their career, it starts to blend out into other areas of their life on there. That not only are they happy in their career, but they start to see themselves as a navigator and maybe their um, the way they deal with health or maybe their family life where they start taking the initiative more because the item of leadership is the ability to have that vision and then act on it. And as redefining leadership in the new workplace is your ability to help guide someone through that path and help them not only eliminate their life in the workplace of leadership, but also a life full of leadership on there. And that itself is the aspect and the whole concept of redefining leadership in the new decade. Again, the slides can be found at jeffjbutler.com slash slides. I know Kathy also has the PDF, so you can also contact her as well for that. With that said, uh, we can now open it up to a Q&A session.